Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Um, I'm Philippa, I'm from the Dyslexia Association of London and uh, we're very excited today to um, be collaborating with groups and with Penny Aston. So mm -hmm. Penny is a keynote speaker, she's a counsellor, a coach and a trainer and um, today and she, she runs the organisation groups which um, provides dyslexia aware counselling and coaching approach. Um, mm. She is currently today going to talk about the emotional repercussions of dyslexia during the COVID-19 crisis. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass you across to Penny and thank you so much Penny for being with us today. My absolute pleasure, thanks Philippa and hi everyone. On this lovely morning, it's raining here in London, in lockdown London. Um, yes, I'm Penny Aston. I'm the founder and director of Groups for Sexual Aware Counselling. And we've been running since about 2007, looking at the emotional repercussions of dyslexia and how we can support our dyslexic community therapeutically. We, we kind of wondered what we could do to continue to support our community through this crisis, the pandemic that's going on. And we thought it might be helpful just to start off with some webinars that touch on some of the work that we've done and how it might reflect on dyslexic people and how they deal with their emotions. So I'm going to be nattering for about half an hour and we will take questions at the end. So have a think as we go through and I think you can type them in the, in the box as we go and I will do my best to answer those. If not, we'll find a way of getting them answered. So what we're going to be looking at today, <laughs> of course things are not working, bear with me one sec, there we go. Um, why you might be feeling certain emotions, for dyslexic people the unknown can feel absolutely terrifying because we have these amazing brains that can look at things all over the place. Um, and how the constitutional presentations of dyslexia might exacerbate or indeed help. In fact, um, I, I am of the opinion that the way we've had to manage our lives is giving us um, a way of being able to deal with the catastrophe that's going on at the moment. Then we're going to look at some strategies, some simple strategies that we can put into place that help us to deal with the anxiety that might be being raised. I just want you to have a little look at the slide on the right. Um, the comfort zone, the feel safe and in control is somewhere that dyslexic people are not that familiar with anyway. They're, they are much more uh, aware of the fear zone, the lack of self-confidence, um, not understanding quite what's going on. And for the first time, I think neurotypical people are getting a taste of what it feels like to be us in a world that is unpredictable, that is unknown. But with all these things, there's always a positive and it pushes us, as we know only too well, into the learning zone. Being able to find strategies, find ways of coping, acquire new skills, and eventually that goes through into the growth zone. So we, in a way, um, are able to model a way of being that helps not only ourselves, but those that we love and are, are near us and uh, the, the other people that are around us to, to model a way of being, of being able to cope, because we're kind of used to it. Weirdly, our brains are wired to be able to cope with this better than most. You Penny, may also sorry, find... Sorry to interrupt. A couple of people said they can't see the, um, the picture very well, just to let them know that if you double click on the picture, it will make the picture the main um, part of the presentation and Penny will go smaller. So just for people that are struggling with that, sorry to interrupt you, Penny. Okay, okay. So they've, got, they've you. got me as well as the slides, right? Remember that, Penny? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so everyone's double clicked and now you have a big slide and a, a less big Penny. Um, so moving on, not to get distracted with my dyslexic brain. Uh, evolution has a way of helping us to cope, and that is that we are primed for survival. So when there's something that's unknown, we go into hyper alert. And when we're in that anxious brain, it's actually really difficult to think coherently, to think 
with our, our rational brain to think of things out. So often we will be in fight and flight. It's important to remember that. Important to remember it because as we have been working since 2007, we've worked with thousands of clients now. And we've come up with this table of presenting issues that dyslexic people often have to deal with or often feel. We've been helped with this by people like Professor Bob Burden, uh, Sylvia Moody, Lindsay Peer, to name a few, but essentially it's come from our clients, from, from our stakeholders. Now this isn't because they're dyslexic, it's because of what they've experienced because they are dyslexic, big difference. In order to understand it um, a little better, many of this may be familiar to you and anyone who's filled in any of our referral forms will, will have seen it, but this graph gives you an idea of what dyslexic people are contending with, certainly when they engage with our service. And as you can see at the, the top end, the percentages, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, generalized anxiety. Often this comes from early years experience and some unresolved traumas is the only way I can kind of put it. Um, being being labeled a certain way of being, being markedly different in the way that we process information. What it also does is give us a wiring that helps us cope in different environments. So as unpleasant as many of this might be, it also suggests to me that we have the aptitude to be able to cope with the difference in our society that's going on at the moment. If you see me looking down, it's just to check that I have got everything in. As a dyslexic, I need to put things down. So enter COVID-19, the coronavirus. We're super primed, we're super sensitive, um, very sensitized creatures, very intuitive but we can pick up on other people's emotions. And in the group context, we can pick up on the fear, which means that we are in full meerkat motion, thinking what might be happening, what's gonna happen next. It's, it's part of evolution. I think it's part of why we are still in the DNA mix. We are able to sense what's going on. In more Neanderthal times, it was what dangers around? What's the weather pattern? Why is the grass moving the way it is? We, we problem solve, we see patterns in things, have higher level strategies that help us to cope. But we can also be at the mercy of our emotions. And I want to just take you through what we consider um, our dyslexic dilemmas. These are things that we kind of have to deal with, whatever. Not great at remembering things. This is a bit of a myth. Sure, working memory, not great, but I think there's a compensation in that we have this amazing long-term memory. And it isn't just little snapshots, it's being able to enter into an experience almost as if it, it's happening again, which can be both a blessing and a curse. But what I want to bring your attention to is the amount of information that is being processed at that particular time. It isn't static, it's often moving, and it's every detail. We see everything in it. Because of that, we can tend to get easily overwhelmed, and a dyslexic overwhelm is not a pretty sight. It's when everything seems to sort of short circuit, but it's because we hold so many things in this magnificent mind of ours, and we're trying to make um, an understanding of what's going on, to make sense of it. At the moment, we can't make sense of anything because nobody knows that big sense of unknown. And when you have all these images going around in your mind, all these thoughts going around in your mind, it's really hard to retrieve words, to make coherent sentences when we're flitting through one file. The dyslexic filing system is, is an awesome thing to behold, but it isn't necessarily A to Z, it can be all over the place. With our ability to be very intuitive and very empathic, we are super sensitized creatures. Um, I, I am aware that many clients have been accused of being you know, just oversensitive. Yeah, great, we are. In a way, 
all our senses come in at the same velocity. There's very little filter on it. And if you don't understand, that's, that's actually part of our gift. Hearing, sight, sound, light, fantastic if you are in a creative way. If it is intrusive, then that's when it becomes difficult. So we have to really look after our environment and make sure that it, it works for us. As you can appreciate at the moment, our environment is quite uh, difficult to contend with and in some ways not very manageable, which we will come to later in the webinar. Energetically, that, that visual time traveling can be exhausting. Um, and we have to be very aware of how much energy is being expended, and which is why we don't particularly like too much change. Our, our higher level thinking strategies are what are uh, enabling us to cope when there's change. All those strategies that very often are unconscious, and 90% of what we do is done unconsciously, all those strategies have to be rethought. That takes time and that takes practice. And for many dyslexic minds, they really want to know why something ha is happening so that they can start problem solving. There's no answer to the why at the moment. And that can throw us into two different ways. One is general sort of disorganization. Um, you can't see it, but if you looked around, you see piles of papers and different post-it notes and things everywhere. But I know where everything is. And the other side are OCD-like tendencies which is a kind of self-soothing is that, right, I'm going to organize everything and then everything will be okay. All of these things are the sort of general dilemmas that we have to cope with. Um, and something that we found with clients is that they assume that their dyslexia was to do with reading and writing and to do with school. And when school finished, everything will be okay. And they were quite shocked to realize that they were actually dyslexic for life and that aspects of dyslexia can affect every part of their lives. So we help people to self-advocate and that's being able to understand oneself, understand yourself so that you can ask for the things you need and be part of a community and understand that these things are, they are our usual, they are normal as opposed to 90% of the population. But we do need to be proactive rather than reactive with our energy. We've got a fundamentally different way of processing information and it costs a lot energetically. Um, Dean Bregonia, which uh, you can look him up on, on YouTube, an amazing neuroscientist, dyslexic neuroscientist, reckons that it's about four times more energy to be neurodiverse in a neurotypical world. When we're trying to learn, it takes four times more energy to use our brains in the way we need to make sense of what it is we're learning. We like to practice, we like to keep rehearsing, which is absolutely fine. And the table that I, I showed you before, it isn't that that um, only happens to us as dyslexic, it happens to everybody. The difference is that the dyslexic child, the dyslexic person is dyslexic 24 hours a day. And all this information coming in is more frequent, it's more intense. And ultimately, if you're not aware of the demand on you, it can be extremely depleting, it's effort squared. And when there are role changes, that's when change becomes difficult because all the strategies that we have honed very carefully no longer apply. We've got to start from scratch again. We then get into that Neanderthal reptilian part of our mind, um, lizard brain, I call it, which is about fight and flight, or indeed freeze and flop going into to depression and, and darkness. In a way, it's um, a coping mechanism for our nervous system to make sure that we still survive, but very difficult if you don't understand why it's happening. When you're the one learning, you have to go to bed at seven o'clock and you are sleeping so deeply. These are the reasons why. So let's look at the facts as we know them. They change each day. When we started preparing this webinar, uh, it feels like it was six months ago. Things have shifted so much just in the last week. There's a pandemic, whatever that means. We hear about it, we've read about it, but never thought it would actually happen to us, and it is. And the worst part of it, 
for everyone is the not knowing. However, dyslexic people are used to not knowing. We know what it feels like in our bodies and we have an ability to time travel both into the past where we can tend to ruminate or indeed into the future where we can tend to be an anxious, but it's also the possibility for problem solving. To be able to access all those different experiences, to hook on to how they all make sense is something that our brains are well equipped to cope with. I think it's part of our evolutionary gift to be able to do this. And we have also, in many cases, not all, but a lived experience of isolation. It is um, in order to make ourselves feel safe, we create environments that are okay for us so we don't get overstimulated. Uh, the worst sort of environment we've found with clients who have uh, a very high level of distress is often because they are in open plan offices, they're hot desking, there's a lot of noise, uh, strip lighting that's flashing, they have to wear a uniform that's uncomfortable. All these things for our super sensitized neurodiverse people is, is hell on earth, to be perfectly honest. So we are super sensitive, but we are well suited to new social restrictions. We've had to cope with lots of different things changing over the years, and this is just one of them. We've also been able to use our hobbies in order to find purpose and meaning. We, we rarely find ourselves getting bored because those special interests that we had are often become our profession and we enjoy our own company. So neurotypical people, for the first time, I think are beginning to feel how we've often felt in the past. It's a very interesting social observation. So what do we do? We, we need to use our strengths. Um, I've put up a slide here from Wonderful Dyslexia Daily, which gives many of the strengths that are, are known to exist for dyslexic people. And at the end of this webinar, these slides will be available. So, so feel free to have a look at it in more detail. But what I also want to bring your attention to on the right side are the things that don't get A stars in tests. They are the things that dyslexic people, neurodiverse people have in abundance and what makes them the unique, amazingly gifted people that they are. Enormous amounts of resilience and fortitude and determination. Now, whether this is innate to our tribe, if you like, or whether it comes from the um, adversaries that we have through our lives, I don't know, but they are certainly um, gifts that many people have that will come into force in this particular situation that we find ourselves with the pandemic. In particular, I've, I've noticed when people are walking that instead of walking to go somewhere, walking to, to do, people are walking and just being as they can walk, and that sense of wonder at looking at things. So we use our strength, but we also need to bring in our dyslexic mental health toolkit. Well, this is really anyone's toolkit, I would suggest at the moment, but for dyslexic people particularly, I will focus on. Routine. Now, routine for us is what contains us. It soothes us. I need to put my keys in a certain place and have the self-discipline to put them there because I know that if I don't, I'm going to be in a frantic mess because my mind will take me into all the things that might potentially go wrong. I need to keep to that routine. And now more than anything, when we're all stuck in our homes with lots of other people around us, lots of things that feel strange, we need to set in place a routine that helps our nervous system to stay soothed. So I suggest strongly, instead of lounging around in your jammies, which must have felt like a sort of godsend when it all started, now get up, get dressed. Um, I've found with some clients actually putting on shoes, trainers, whatever it might be, to feel that you actually are ready for action is very helpful. Minimizing snacking. Um, this is an opportunity, comfort eating, great. You want to feel 
filled up, you want to feel kind of secure, but it does also pull your system down. So stick to the meal times and stick to the bedtimes. This is actually an opportunity for us to reconnect with our circadian rhythms, our natural rhythms, ones that aren't dictated to by our work environment, ones that are there naturally. And we're coming into spring, we've just come through solstice, and it is an opportunity to tune into that. And of course, exercise. Wouldn't it be nice if we could go out and enjoy the sunshine? Can for one hour a day, as long as we're moving. But we can also exercise at home and take the opportunity to fine tune our bodies. And also it creates hormones that soothe us, make us feel like we have reconnected, got it back into our bodies. Needless to say, um, you can learn a skill. There's so much coming through over the last week or two, masses and masses of online things. Um, it depends what turns you up, um, whatever the skill is, now is the opportunity that you could take it up. I read this everywhere, but also it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to think, well, I have all these other skills. I have these other gifts and strengths. What's something which I always said, if I had time, I would like to focus on. Not necessarily what you think you should do, but what you've always wanted to do. Get in contact with your own needs. What do I need to put in place? Because this world that we're in just at the moment won't always be this way. It will pass. We don't know how long, six weeks, six months, six years, but it will pass. And we will bring all the experiences from now into our future self. So this is the opportunity to do that. To set a goal, whatever, however small that goal might be, it might even be, right, tomorrow I'm gonna get up and get dressed by nine o'clock. Great, do it. Give yourself a tick for it, which is fant fantastic. Find purpose in things, clearing out cupboards, doing a window box, whatever it might be, and realizing all this stuff that we've accumulated, what it actually means to you. We have um, an awesome uh, opportunity to connect with others. This for me goes two ways. One that we can connect with many others, but many of us um, are quite insular and we don't need that amount of connection. So in some ways, it's fantastic enough already. Okay, you decide what's your limit. We can't do that so much with um, our family that we are living in, in, in close quarters with, but we can contract to allow everybody to be able to do a little of what they need at some point in the day, even if there's a small space. I would also suggest switch off the news. It is 24 seven in our face all the time. We know what's going on and watch something that lifts the spirit because the brain will react the, those the, the the hormones that are released the chemicals that are released in the brain as feel-good chemicals are released by watching something whether it's a film that's upbeat nature programs whatever it might be but we don't need to have 24 7 of how difficult the situation is we already know now I pop this in with a little little light viewing, looking at the map for some weekend travel ideas. How are we going to manage this space when we are in such a contained environment? Um, some people have got small children, some people it's just one person and they're isolated. Think about what your creative mind needs and contract with other members of your family to have half an hour each day, each person have half an hour each day in a place where you can just be, to let that dyslexic mind just fly, just think, because that's the way we problem solve. It's using our imagination, it's looking at the things that are going on, because whilst that's all going on on one level of consciousness, unconsciously, we are problem solving as well. And with our amazing memory, our, our visual memory, being able to make sense of different things, being able to think, what, what can I do that's different? What am I learning here that I can also share with my kids or with my partner? Also an opportunity, if you are on your own, to value what it feels like to be on your own, possibly the first time ever. Creating different spaces that work for everyone. 
also looking at your own internal space. So there's the dyslexic toolkit, the everybody toolkit, and then there's, I can't cope with this, I'm going nuts, what am I going to do? Strategies for anxiety and overwhelm. Remember, we are built to be on guard. We are built to be alert. We are built for survival. Our brain, our nervous system, that's all it's interested in, survival of this human creature that it is within. So when we are in an anxious place, we are in that lizard brain, in that reptilian brain, and we are unable to connect with the thinking brain, the neocortex. We have to bring things in that reconnect the lizard brain with the thinking brain. Part of what's going on, there are extreme emotions. We want to push it away. We want to pretend that it's not going on. And when we are in distress, we can lash out at others. So we need to be looking at some strategies, one of compassion for ourselves and those that are around us, but a certain amount of acceptance. I can't do anything about the bigger picture, what's going on, other than abide by the rules, the regulations that are in place. But what I can do is look out for what's going on in me. I can look at the things that I can do. I can get up in the morning, look after my children. I can cook a meal. And it's really being in the process of mindfulness, I guess a, a very overused term at the moment, but it is being in the here and now, rather than time traveling back to the past what's gone wrong, into the future, what might potentially go wrong. It's thinking, what can I do right here and now? Because we have to let go of feeling that we can control everything. We are learning the hard way. There is no control over this. We don't know what's going to happen, but we can control how we react to it. And one of the ways we can do that is with our breath, this breath that we're becoming so familiar with and to breathe out longer than we breathe in. It's called 7-Eleven breathing. For me, it's more 5-3 breathing, but the idea is that the out breath is two, three, four paces more than the in breath. And it's the thinking about the breath, the cognitive attachment to the breath that allows us to start calming things down, tells the lizard brain, it's okay, we're getting our nervous system back into that window of comfort. Another tip is to ground yourself. With our dyslexic way of thinking, it's like having tendrils that go out to the edges of the universe, which is wonderful when it's all creative and, and lots of ideas and things. Not so great when we are getting quite sort of panic stricken. So grounding yourself is, is sitting with your feet firmly on the ground. It helps to imagine that there are these roots that are going down into the earth and you are part of it. Feel yourself sitting on the seat. Name, name five things that are in the room. The camera, the screen, the lamp, the shoes I've got on. Another idea is a gratitude list. Personally, I find these so difficult, but so useful at the end of it because you realize how much is in your life that is beneficial. Not how we would want it to be ideally, but then it's looking at the things that we are gaining from it, to have our, our loved ones around us, not being sick, to be able to get on a computer and, and communicate with people. And allow yourself to feel emotions, feel them, allow yourself the privilege of naming it. It might be sad, it might be grief, it might be mourning for what might have been. That's okay. Have a cry, cry into a pillow, thump a pillow, get it out and move on. If you find that it's difficult, keep on trying. This is a bit like um, developing your, your mental health muscle. Of course, if it hasn't been used before, it's gonna feel pretty flabby, but rehearsing and trying and moving on and trying again the next day does build it up. And remember that panic and fear are contagious. And sometimes we need to differentiate between what somebody else is like. My children might be panicking, they're scared. You're scared, everybody's scared. 
but so is calm. And just being able to say to someone, come here. And whilst you're feeling that way, whilst you're anxious, whilst you're scared, I'm just going to sit here and be with you. So our world has changed. It has changed. And I doubt it will ever be the same again because of all the things that have happened. This stage of panic and alarm, though, will fade. It may take time, but it will fade. We are uniquely blessed with being able to be um, mobile in the way we deal, creative thoughts and, and ideas of how we can cope. And I do believe that the world needs more dyslexic people because we can model a way of being. We're kind of used to being here. We're used to difficult situations. In a way, we're better primed to be able to cope. I hope when we come out of it, that there will be a better respect from people who best work at home, that are able to work not in isolation, but in their own space, they're comfortable in their own space, and that there will be more gratitude for the people who will problem solve things. The fact that we're able to do this today is down to Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, both dyslexics. So where would we be without dyslexic people? So the good news is it's a temporary state where we will find meaning in it. Look how we've managed to connect with people. And I see people walking and really engaging with their environment. And there's opportunity to use both our differences and our strengths. Uh, a mindful exercise is often to put all your emotions in your hands and remembering that we are the sky and our emotions are the weathers and move it away from us, realizing that those weathers will change. It may be thunder and lightning one day, it might be sunshine the next, but the sky is always there. They will, this will move on. And a final encouragement, I laughed when I saw this. Shakespeare, because we're all going to be Shakespeare through this, aren't we? We're all going to skills, do all our goals. Shakespeare wrote King Lear while in quarantine from the plague. Breathe, appreciate each breath. The pandemic won't test our lungs as much as it will our mental health. And we have a duty to ourselves and those we love to do the very best we can in unusual circumstances. Nothing could be more unusual than we find ourselves at the moment. I'm very happy to take questions at this point and, and just to say that um, people can email us, info at groups, Dot org. Uh, we have a website, you can sign up for our newsletter, there's lots of information there, as there is on Facebook, Groups Dyslexia Aware Counselling and Coaching, and also on Instagram. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Penny, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I know, I know a few of you have mentioned that you may have found it hard to follow everything. There was so much fantastic information in there. So the recording, just to let you know, will be available along with the slides tomorrow. We will be emailing you both of those. So you'll have access to those. So some of you, if you want to watch the recording again, you can do that. And some of you, if you want to refer back to the slides, um, they'll be available. Um, we've had a few questions come in. So um, Penny, if you're happy, I can I can read these out to you. Um, they're in no particular order. So I, I will be able to cover all of the questions we've had so far. Um, I wondered, we've got the first question here from, from Anonymous. Are you able to say something about dyslexia and ADHD during self-isolation at all? Well, we use dyslexia um, as an umbrella term because there, there's often a lot of comorbidity. Um, you're not just dyslexic. There are all sorts of parts of neurodiversity that kind of come into it. So I hope that what I've talked about in the last half an hour applies to the majority of the neurodiverse presentations. Um, I am dyslexic myself, so I'm expert on myself and on dyslexia. I am not an expert on ADHD, although I understand that the program that we've put together has been as beneficial for those with ADHD as it has been for other neurodiverse people. If there's something more specific there, please do write back in and I'll do my best to answer it. 
Thanks, Penny. Um, next question. Uh, Mariana says, thank you so much for the seminar. Um, she said, are there any tips on to how to best to communicate with those near and dear um, about how we might be struggling at the moment? Us dyslexics. I would always um, suggest calm communication. Uh, it's getting, it's recognizing in yourself when you're in an emotionally charged place or the other person is as well. Many people have to, to take themselves out of a fraught place in order to calm themselves down, to think about it, to come back. And it's being able to articulate your needs very clearly. Part of the difficulty for dyslexic people with the emotional repercussions is that 90% of the population haven't needed to really think about it. Whereas 10% of us have always found it quite a struggle to articulate our needs. So we have to teach them to self-advocate, to be able to say, you may not understand what this is about, but this is what I need at the moment in order to remain in a calm, contained, centered place. Does that help? I hope. That's great, thank you. Um, next question is from Manila. Um, she said, I have a short term memory, currently struggling to remember things. What strategies would you use to help improve memory? Right. Um, for our short term memory, we are always a little at its mercy. I would suggest always making lists, making notes. Phones for some people are great, they can, they can make notes on them, but the important thing is when you think it, to actually write it down somewhere or be able to access it. Because our, our minds are, are so awesome in the way that they think of everything all at the same time. But if, if we're not particularly interested in something, it will fly away like a piece of bit of fog in, in the wind. So I would suggest that writing it down, knowing that that will always be in a place. I have note places all over, over the place so I can go and look and I can remember what it feels like to write, but I might not be able to remember what it was that I wrote. When we are in um, a stressful situation, the likelihood of us being able to remember anything is fairly remote. Remember that lizard brain. Oh, get out of the way, get out of the way. So, okay, I need to write it down because when I'm in a more reflective mood, when I'm in a thinking mood, then I will be able to actually action it. And what goes in with that as well is, is when you are feeling in a stress situation, don't do something that's too complex. Go and do something that isn't um, that essential or doesn't need to have the amount of focus. Wait till you're in a calm place. Thank you, Penny. Um, next question was from Tom. He, um, he asked what the name of the neuroscientist was. Oh, yes. Um, Dean Bragonia. It's on the slide, so um, you'll get sent a copy. Have a look on you YouTube. He, he's a dyslexic neuroscientist. Um, I think it's sensational. Talks a lot of sense. Dean Bragonia. Thank you. Yes, I think it was. It, that's, I think that's, it, that's, that's the way he pronounced it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks, Penny. Um, and next question uh, is from Anna. She would like to know some more mm. strategies for managing tunnel vision in tasks. Sometimes it can be really great, but sometimes it can completely take over and isolation is exacerbating tunnel vision for her. Say the question again, please, Philippa. So um, Anna oh, so would I like to on know. a dyslexic mind trip then. Yeah. That's okay. I'm also dyslexic and I'm having to read and, and <laughs> process at the same time. So bear with me as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, so Anna's asking about tunnel vision. She suffers from mm -hmm. tunnel vision. Sometimes it can be really great, but sometimes it can completely take over. And being in isolation is exacerbating the problem for her. I need to, to challenge the word problem. If it is focusing on something uh, to a creative end and to a positive end, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, there's the psychology of flow, which is the kind of channel this energy to be able to focus on some in a sort of microscopic detail in a way is this not an opportunity 
to not be interrupted and to be able to utilize that, making sure that you're not getting exhausted with it. So if you are able to visualize tunnel visual thingy and it's positive and only you will know, then fine. If you're finding it draining, then it's breaking every 45 minutes to an hour, wander around your space, get a cup of tea, coffee, hot water, whatever it might be, and then go back to it when you feel a little more refreshed. I don't necessarily see that as a problem, more something to be handled. Okay, thank you, Penny. Um, we have, Anila says, what, uh, I think we've, we've covered some of these actually. Okay, so next question would be, Linda said, how would you advise children and young people with dyslexia on how to cope with the current situation? Within the limited topic, I, I know people were saying there's a lot of information there, but within, within the limited topic of today, I've tried to cover most things. Where I would suggest is that you go online, have a look, there are loads of Facebook support groups that are offering all sorts of ideas to help teenagers and children contend with this. From my perspective as a dyslexia aware counsellor, it is about being okay with emotions and you as a parent being able to model that you can cope because they'll pick it up from you. And if they're anxious, being able to sit with their anxiety and not having to fix it. Strategies are for another expert to be able to advise. It's not my area of expertise, but emotionally it's being able to contain your own emotions so that your child feels safe with you. And it will pass. It will pass. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, I have a 42 year old son with dyslexia and autism and mental health difficulties. As I am a vulnerable person, I'm not allowed to see him. So his siblings are helping out, but he will not engage with FaceTime. So I can't even see him. Therefore, have you any tips whereby I can liaise, talk, talk through with my, with my son over the phone? I, I, I think they mean and that is from Teresa. I think, Teresa, that that's a very difficult situation and you may well have a group of other people who are in a similar, similar situation to you. Um, I, I'm more concerned with how you contend with the emotions that it's kind of kicking up for you. It's a very difficult situation to not be able to communicate with someone that you love. This may sound a bit daft, but I do believe that feeling the emotion and emanating the love you feel for him can be felt by the other person. It's something we use in therapy and counseling, obviously be it being in connection with the other person. Um, and sometimes the words are there, but it's the, it's the felt feeling. So, what I would suggest is emotionally look after yourself when you when you are able to talk to and even off the phone and you feel that disconnect, maybe say a little bit about how you are feeling and maybe that will be received with the love I'm sure it's intended. Thanks, Penny. Um... Next question is from Essen. Um, like many of us nowadays, I tend to have more video conference calls more than ever, which I find very hard to focus and struggle to articulate my thoughts. Yeah. What would be the advice to cope with video conference calls in the best way? What I find interesting is that we, we work with the emotional repercussions of dyslexia. And the reason we set the organization up was that we realized that the people with dyslexia were getting for the skills training and the software training, all this kind of thing, when they were in an emotionally charged state. So our view is that you can't take on more learning until you are in a calm mental state. An anxious brain cannot learn. Essen, the, the, the difficulty with this is that there's going to be rehearsal and familiarity. 
it, it's about knowing yourself and yeah I agree with you it is draining I'm kind of all screened out by the end of the day at the moment so I'm having to put in various different breaks I'm having to make notes uh, like most dyslexic people it, it is hard to retrieve the right words when everything is coming in as a mass and it may be that you need to set up a format whereby you can feed back after you've had time to process the information because as soon as you start getting anxious about it that's when the the shutters kind of come down and you're not really contributing anyway but it's being able maybe to communicate with the people that are also on video calls um, and remember that we're, we're not at our, our optimum when there are lots of people talking there's lots of information to take in because we we communicate by um, unconsciously watching body language tone of voice all the mannerisms of people so we, we are in a new phase of learning how to keep our environment as safe and secure as we can so that our minds are calm so that we can interact i hope that helps thanks penny next question is from laura um what would you suggest in order to manage homework momentum what the role of parents might be or not be <laughs> <laughs> We're going every which way, aren't we? Um, I wish I had an easy answer to this. My children are now much older. That comes with its own different anxieties. Uh, so I've been reading a lot about what's going on with homework and I can only really pass on what, I, what I've surmised from it, which is that in many ways, it isn't so much kind of getting the homework done and it shouldn't be for eight hours a day. There are ways of, of sort of limiting it and the school should be inputting some information. But it's again, having a routine, putting in things that the child is good at and enjoys as well. Because often what can happen at school is the things that the children enjoy is taken away in order to put the time towards learning the things that education deems we, we should know, the reading and the writing part of it. So as making it as enjoyable as possible, and also as they're observing you doing the things you do, that's life, that's about learning about life. So I might get shouted down for this. I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about getting the, the, the homework done, getting the schoolwork done, than it's all coming out of this with mental health. So trust your instincts with this one, do what the child is, is capable emotionally of, of doing at any given time, have uptime, have loving time, and listen, don't try to fix. Thanks, Peter. On that note, um, we'll try and get through as many as we've got quite a few questions coming in hard and fast. We've got just over 10 minutes. Um, um, I'm gonna, I'm I'll gonna do my best, but just remember it's about the emotional side of it. <laughs> Um, Karen has, has messaged in uh, also saying that she's having to work remotely supporting students with maths difficulties and um, she's finding it very difficult. Any advice? Uh, she's finding it very difficult. Any advice? I want to know what she's finding difficult. Is it the communication? Is it working remotely, Just working remotely work, with working the, remotely. the students? Yeah. It takes time. We, we've had to learn to use Skype and Zoom over the years for, for clients who are global. <clears throat> and initially, it, 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 is, it is tricky. And we, I said to someone a little earlier that many of these things are about rehearsing. It's about practicing. It's building up um, whatever muscle we need to be able to do the work that we have to do. It might be an idea to look at what you are doing well now. Sometimes we try and do it all in one big dollop. If we take it bit by bit, making sure that the other person understands the to and fro, the conversation is there, that may well help. The other part of it is what emotions are coming up for you? Is it because it's a screen? Is it because you can't find your words? Is it that you don't understand the topic? I don't know when you say difficult, but just to chunk that down. What I would also recommend is that, you know, online, anyone can access this, is Google Emotion Wheel. And 
within it, there'll be all sorts of different emotions that just helps us to fine tune how we're actually feeling. Often as dyslexic people, we feel all the feels, but we don't actually know what it is that we're feeling. We just know it, all our nerves on the outside of our skin. The more we have self-knowledge, the more we can self-advocate, the, the calmer we can be in a situation. Great, thank you. Um, Linda, I've got your question here and also um, I noticed that you missed a few things. So there's a recording which you'll get tomorrow so you can listen back um, at anything that, that Penny's answered, even the Q&A is today. So um, you've also, your question is, does dyslexia present issues with decision making? Does our ability to see all possibilities leave us paralysed sometimes? I think we can all connect with that one. <laughs> I, I think we can all connect with it and that's where community comes in. But we can label ourselves as being chaotic or thick or stupid or whatever it might be but the wonderful thing with the community is and it, you'll, you'll see it on the slides is that there are certain things that we all do and we have this amazing mind and we are able to hold these ideas in our mind all at the same time but remember it's not just linear it we go through it over it round it oh it, so it becomes this sort of mass of ideas Part of the art and craft of working with the dyslexic mind is to understand that and to be able to work with the procrastination that it often brings about, that the chaos that can disorganization that it, 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 can, it can bring about. But also to view it with a, with a tenderness as well, because not everybody has that privilege of being able to hold all those things, all that creativity, to be able to time travel through events in, in microscopic detail to be able to connect all of that. So I, I see it more as um, uh, the, the image that came to mind was a, a horse that, I hate this term, needs to be broken in, but it's learning the rules of who and how we are. Because we are only 10% of the population, but we all do much the same things that we learn from each other. And it can feel very chaotic, but also, it is something to be thrilled about because not everybody can do that and it is a gift. Emotional well-being, look for your emotional well-being in that. Great, we've got a few few more questions. Um, so Yasmin popping up more and more. <laughs> Yasmin said um, a, a problem is the ability to focus. Yeah. Um, she sits with her work without being distracted how can she sit with the work without being distracted or overwhelmed and also suffers with boredom, particularly because it's dealing with linear thought and writing? I'm assuming you mean your work is, is, is dealing with linear thought and writing. Yeah. Right. Um, that overwhelm is your nervous system kind of coming online saying too much, too much, too much energy kind of going out. So it's organizing and practicing what you can do. Uh, there, there are particular days, I have dyslexic days, everybody has dyslexic days, where you know, you'll, you'll walk into the side of an open door or everything becomes kind of jumbled. But it's thinking about, okay, if that, this is one of those days, let's make a list of what I can do, or even talk it out, because as long as it gets it out of, your head, which will be holding all these ideas, not only the words, but all the images. Get it written down what I can do. Because sometimes it feels very overwhelming because it's batting around in your head. When you speak it out, when you do a mind map, it can be something that's doable in stages. Now there are some days, all I know I can do is do the washing up and hope that I don't break a cup. There are other days that my mind is phenomenal and the energy will be supreme and I can carry on and do amazing things. But I trust my mind and my system to let me know what I can do and when I can do it. And it's, it's about tuning into who you are. We, we are. we are differently wired. We have to learn to see ourselves as these unique beings that we are, not conforming to what others kind of say normal is that that's a whole different thing we, we are neurodivergent we function differently so get to know yourself and when you're at your optimum maybe it's in the morning maybe it's in the afternoon you are the best judge of that 
but but also do know this is not singular to you these are all challenges that that we all have to deal with at some point or other and particularly in this situation with COVID-19. Wow, thanks Vinny. Last few questions um, from Emma. Um, I'm so glad to have found groups. I'm late diagnosed with little support, support off work due to a sensory shutdown and struggle Ooh. to read up on dyslexia processing issues. How do I get on the right path for acceptance, self-advocacy and strategies? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> Dys dyslexia aware counselling. <laughs> yeah. I'm bound to say that, aren't I? What you've just summarised is what all our, our clients present with, that um, life's chaotic, uh, meltdowns, don't know what to do with myself, can't do anything. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we tend to do is compare ourselves to what others say is a normal way of being we have to know what our normal is we have to be proactive in looking at our energy outputs rather than reactive that that's a likelihood of us um, running on empty we we have to look after our, our our car our model if we're having to do a lot of things and we're not filling up with petrol we break down we we aren't able to function so it's recognizing and becoming familiar with the emotions, how you feel them in your body. And remembering as soon as you start feeling stressed, it's unlikely that you'll be able to do the very best work. As you get to know yourself, read up on it, read books. There, there are articles I've written, articles that others have written that help you to realize this is uniquely our tribe, our community. These are the ways we function. And only we can self-advocate. The reason I say that is that we have to have our own back. Um, people will say, I can't do this because I'm dyslexic. No, nah, we can do everything because we're dyslexic. I am dyslexic and I may need you to do this in order that I can aspire to the highest level thinking skills that I have as a natural gift. It's, it's self-knowledge, self-knowledge. And if counseling helps counseling. Thanks, Penny. We've got three more questions. So I think if, we, if we're okay, just to go over a couple of minutes over time to um, answer everyone's questions then. Um, so from Anonymous, on that note, um, they've written, I've, I've had a very difficult time advocating for myself with my university. We have had online exams put into place and the university refuses to implement our ec extra time as the claim of extra time is already included in the extended time period for submission. I've been feeling very upset and frustrated with their response. I also feel like even more out of place compared to my peers than ever before. How do you advise we are kind to ourselves while self-advocating with people that don't understand dyslexia very much? Very, very difficult. Again, you know, the, the, this is a very painful place to be. Practical things. Um, you will often have disability support at a university. My criticism there, it's often by someone who isn't neurodiverse themselves. I think it's, to me, it's really important because the nuances, the differences in, in living life as a neurodiverse person are, are, are so different that it, it's hard for a neurotypical person to understand. It seems very cruel cool that it's sort of put online and, and extra support has been put in. I can't say there's a solution that I can offer. What I can say is the British Dyslexia Association knows, is a remarkable organisation, but also knows some remarkable people who can offer support. What I can say also is that for us, it can take longer to pass exams, to get to the place we want. But when we do get there, boy, do we know it, because we, we go right into the detail we don't do surface terribly easily, we don't do mass terribly easily, but we do depth and few very well. In a, in a way, this is kind of survival of doing the very best you can in the most extraordinary circumstances. Um, look after yourself. My heart goes out to you, no easy answers there. What I would say is you're, you're not alone. Get onto some forums and see what they can offer to support you. Even talking to someone who's in the same situation, do what you can do. 
Yes, yeah, so and it might be worth um, speaking to the disability officer at the university. Um, they might be able to provide some support at this time. Um, if you have any issues finding out who they are, you haven't spoken to them before, we're more than happy at Dyslexia Association of London to, to help you with that process. So by all means, um, email us, uh, info at dyslexialondon.org. I'll, I'll put that in the chat box as well if you need any further assistance. Um, okay, last couple of questions. So uh, for those of us who are also working during this time, what can we do to communicate to our workplaces how to cope with this difficult time so say the question again please, please um so parvi has said that for those of us who are dyslexic and working during this difficult time mm -hmm. is there anything we can do to communicate to our i guess bosses and peers and colleagues um which would help us cope better i guess about being dyslexic um <sighs> right i i <laughs> I, I would like to think that any organization management would be aware that people are going to feel pretty distressed at the moment. And do know that, that with distress, our dyslexic presentations <laughs> do, do <laughs> magnify. Um, if you know what you need to have in place, and it might be that you need to ask someone several times how to do something to explain it to you several times it's about you keeping calm as well saying we're in a difficult situation i am still working i'm i'm doing the best i can in situations like this i may need to ask you to tell me how to do something and ask you to keep your patience with me it's the way that i learn if you are saying it in, in a calm manner it's very hard for the other person to then kind of you know we've all seen the the eye roll, but it is, you've said it, you have stated what your need is, and they are obliged, morally obliged in this situation to be empathic about it and do the very best they can to support you. Thanks, Penny. Um, we've got the last few questions, which I feel probably re more relevant for um, us, which is uh, to do with the, how, how to cope with, English is your second language as a dyslexic. Um, I believe everything that you've spoken about today is also relevant if um, English is your second language. Um, I know it can be even more difficult um, for people. Um, and uh, we're more than happy to talk to you about that further, Maka. So thank you for that question. And also we have another question from Tom who said he's struggling with things like internet backing, job applications, um, and dyslexia friendly processes. Again, um, we will be running a, uh, the Dyslexia Association of London will be running a webinar with a financial coach um, to talk about some of the options because we understand some of you are self-employed and trying to put things into layman's terms. So hopefully that will help you, Tom. I don't know if you've You've got anything to add there, Penny, uh, with Tom's um, predicament? Um, I did a very dyslexic thing then. I wandered off into my imagination <laughs> thinking about Tom and all the other questions, and I haven't got a clue what Tom's initial question was. Now. <laughs> no, that's absolutely yeah. fine. I, I think... Um, um, it's very informative. <laughs> there, yes, it was about application forms and things. My heart yeah. sank. Yeah. 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 Philip is great at that, Tom. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of job applications, um, there's the charity, the, the dyslexia charity, Exceptional Individuals. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll drop you if, you, if you want to drop us an email, Tom, and we can help you as best we can, maybe put you in touch with the financial coach and, um, and also give you some details for exceptional di uh, individuals. So um, the email again for us, for anything about the recording and the webinar or anything non kind of counseling related and, and what Penny's been talking about today, um, the email for that is info at dyslexialondon.org, just so you don't overwhelm Penny. And anything to do with counseling, any interest in counseling, um, 
please feel free to, to contact Penny as she, as she gave you her details at the beginning. And they're also on the slides that we will send you tomorrow. So anything we've spoken about will be on the slides that we send you tomorrow. You'll have a recording of also what we've been saying and the Q&A. Um, just wanted to say, people have been saying thank you so much, Penny. So Mark, Mark's very happy that the recording will be sent. Karen says, thank you. It's been really helpful. Um, and Anila just says it, it's not a question but just to say thank you for your optimism it's very inspiring and uh, they feel like they're not alone and, and some understanding of the dyslexia brain Absolutely. so um, Linda yeah. says thank you it was amazing um, I'm sorry if we've missed anybody's questions we've done our best and we've kind of gone a bit over time so um, but we thank you so much everyone for coming and and to Penny you've been fantastic thank you uh, my pleasure my pleasure I hope it's helpful till next time take care everyone <laughs> thank you bye bye bye